University of Pennsylvania, Cary Law School, is a top-ranked Ivy League law school and one of the most selective universities in the world. Undoubtedly, one of the hardest law schools to gain acceptance in the world. A dream for many, but only a few handful ultimately make it. Good morning, everyone. You're watching The Virtual Amicus, and I'm Jay Lodha. Well, today we are joined by a distinguished, noted, and an eminent alumnus of this prestigious law school in conversation with Ms. Manali Sangoi. And just to give you all a brief introduction about our Amicus for today's session, Manali is a real estate lawyer presently working with a top-tiered law firm in Dubai. She advises clients on a range of real estate matters, including development projects, residential, commercial, and mixed use, acquisition and sale of asset, holding companies, development management and construction contracts, acquisition and disposition of real estate, stressed asset sales, commercial leasing, real estate finance, strata ownership, and formation of homeowner associations, title diligence, and regulatory compliance. Prior to relocating to Dubai, Manali worked in the real estate department of a leading real estate and dispute practice in Mumbai. Manali received her Bachelor's of Law from the University of Mumbai and is admitted to the Bar Council of Maharashtra and Goa in India. She gained her Master's in Law from the University of Pennsylvania, Cary Law School, USA, and is also licensed to practice law in the state of New York. So thank you so much, Manali, uh, for taking out time and for doing this. Anything that you wish to say before we start with our Q&A segment? Um, firstly, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to your channel. I'm really excited to be a part of this and I think it's a great endeavor uh, to reach out to students, lawyers and just uh, help people spread their experiences to the larger legal fraternity. Very well, then thank you so much for all the kind words and let's quickly start with our Q&A segment. So uh, question number one, uh, at what stage of the LLB undergraduation course did you decide to uh, study further and pursue the master's program? Um, so it was always on my mind to pursue a master's while I was pursuing my undergraduate degree. But I also recognize that it's important to have some work experience before pursuing your master's because that just makes the master's uh, a more enriching and fulfilling experience. Um, so I started thinking about it, working towards it from my last year of law school. And um, I did my master's two years after I graduated. Very well. Um, going ahead with our next question. So, uh, Manali, if you, in a nutshell, if you could tell us, uh, when is the applicant required to start with the preparation, the, the entire application process? And what all is required for the same in terms of prerequisites, in terms of CV or SOP or good grades, etc.? Okay, so I think the answer to this question is twofold. In terms of the um, material that you have to submit for your um, LLM application, you can start six, eight months in advance because it's a question of putting everything together. Typically, it would be an application form. It would be your statement of purpose, letters of recommendation, your transcripts, and um, a TOEFL or IELTS exam for your English uh, language skills. Um, this usually shouldn't take more than six months, assuming you have everything in order. But your real preparation for the LLM begins years in advance because um, you would need to show that you have good grades to have a strong CV. And that is something you work towards through your entire undergraduate career. When you uh, write your SOP, you need to show what it is that you intend to achieve through the LLM, what your career goals are, what your objectives are, what you can bring to the school um, as a master's student. So that again goes back to what you have done in your undergrad and in your uh, career till you've applied for the LLM. So it, it's a twofold process. You need to start working towards thinking towards your LLM well in advance so that one, you can align your career goals in a way that the LLM takes you further towards the goal. And secondly, you identify what your dream school or your goal schools require for you to get into the school. And then you work towards achieving those prerequisites. For instance, um, if you're really interested in um, a career in corporate law or securities law, so then you look at schools that are um, the best or have the best course offerings in your areas of practice. 
then you see what their requirements are. Is, are high grades an absolute must? Do they require academic publications? Do they put more focus on work experience? And then looking at what their requirements are, you start tailoring your CV and you work towards uh, building that profile up when you eventually apply for your um, LLM. Very well. Now, uh, going ahead with our next question. So, uh, did you shortlist any of the law schools other than UPenn? And why you narrowed it down only to UPenn? Well, is it because of the prestige value that is attached to it? That is regarded as one of the most prestigious colleges in the world? What exactly was the reason? Um, so, I was very clear that I wanted to pursue a general LLM as opposed to a very specific concentrated LLM. So I shortlisted the top ranked schools from an overall perspective, course offerings, the city the school is located in, extracurricular activities, so on. And I applied on that basis. Um, why I chose Penn, I think multiple reasons. Firstly, the Ivy League uh, brand is, is definitely, um, you know, uh, uh, brings a lot of value and, and um, it's, it's a great tag to have on your CV. Um, secondly, Philadelphia is a great city to live in. It's very convenient to travel to Washington, D.C. or New York or Boston, literally anywhere on the East Coast if you're located in Philadelphia. So if you're interested in going to other law schools, attend um, networking events, it just becomes very easy to commute if you're located in Philadelphia. And thirdly, um, the UPenn class is very small. It's just about 100 or 120 students. So it's a very intimate um, group of students where you can actually get to know your um, your peers, network, and also develop a rapport with your um, professors because you're not going to get lost in the whole international student crowd. Um, and lastly, I like the fact that UPenn has its own huge campus. All of West Philadelphia is essentially UPenn. You, you know, all, all their... Um, all their different um, colleges are there, whether it's the uh, School of Medicine, Business, School of Design, all of that is located in one huge campus in West Philly. So you get that sense of living in, in a campus and interacting with students from different disciplines. And it, it just gives you that holistic college experience. Since I come from government law college, and since I am from Mumbai, I didn't have that experience of living a, a campus life. So that was also something that attracted me to UPenn. Apart from, of course, the, you know, usual excellent faculty and great course offerings, which a lot of colleges, most of the top ranked colleges do. But this is what set it apart for me. And that's why I chose uh, Penn. Now, uh, talking about the courses that uh, this prestigious university has to offer, what all courses are available and uh, which ones would you recommend and ultimately which one did you opt for? Um, so again, it's, uh, I did a general LLM. So it allows you to customize your LLM, your curriculum. You can select whatever courses you want. And um, Penn has such a huge range of courses across every imaginable practice area and all the professors are par excellence they're experts in their field they're renowned in their field so um it's not really about one specific course it's the entire course offering which was so um interesting and impressive um and i think one thing that sets pen apart from other colleges is that wharton business school is a part of university of pennsylvania and they have this unique offering only for uh Penn LLM students, which is the Wharton Business Law course. Um, you don't need to apply separately for it. When you put in your application for the LLM, you can at the same time also make an application for the business law course. And it essentially teaches you the business um, fundamentals that you would require to know as a lawyer. So for someone who wants to practice corporate law, it's great in terms of you know the knowledge, being able to learn from professors of business in Wharton. And also to have that brand and that tag that I have, a, you know, I've done a course at Wharton. So I think that is something unique about Penn and it's a huge draw um, in Penn. Um, apart from that, they also have a lot of really interesting clinics. So it's not just about going to class and learning from a textbook or listening to a professor explain concepts. Um, there's a lot of focus on the practicals and skills aspect as well. 
there's a mediation clinic, there's an intellectual property clinic, there's an entrepreneurship clinic, and students who get to be a part of these clinics actually get to work on real life cases. Um, so it's brilliant in terms of exposure as well as learning. Um, and apart from that, of course, uh, there are cross-disciplinary offerings. So you can take courses in Wharton, you can take courses with uh, the political science school, anything that uh, uh, picks your interest, honestly. So um, I think uh, you would fall short of time uh, to just make the most of everything that Penn has to offer in terms of courses, clinics, externships, and all of that. Very well. Um, now going ahead with our next question. So how rigorous was the course uh, uh, at UPenn? Uh, if you could talk us through uh, about the examination pattern, the lectures, the kind of lectures that were conducted there in a nutshell, and how different uh, are the courses taught there are different from the course taught here? Because I think uh, to, as far as GLC is concerned, uh, the, obviously the curriculum was not as rigorous and as structured as it ought to be. Right. Um. Again, one unique thing about Penn here is that in most other law schools, you have two semesters. It typically starts in September, the first semester, and the second one in Jan. Um, but what Penn has uh, specifically for LLM students is a short four-week, five-credit course. This is basically like an introduction to um, US law, legal history, and just getting uh, an idea about the cultural, social, political climate of the country. So before you dive into American law and your semester courses, they give you like a brief overview of the most important fundamental things that you should know. And that is really helpful because when you start a course, say you're doing a course on um, say constitutional law, for instance. So much of constitutional law is based in history. Because we are from India and when we study our history of courts, for instance, or we study constitutional law, we already have that background of our history and all of that in place. Like we know about the uh, the freedom struggle, we know about the colonial past, we know what happened. So we take for granted our existing knowledge when we are studying about law. And law is so intricately twined with society that you can't just study the legal system of a place in isolation. You need to have some context. And this four-week course that Penn offers gives you that context. So when you're studying US constitutional law, you're not lost when you read about the Declaration of Independence, who is Thomas Jefferson. You have that background because they've taken the effort to give you that context in that four-week course. Um, so the so the, the, the year starts with this uh, pre-term introductory course. Then we have our two semesters. Um, we need to have, uh, have at least a minimum of 24 credits to graduate, which is very doable, very simple. Most people take on more than um, 24 credits. Um, in terms of uh, class offering, um, there's a wide variety. You'll have your... Um, 1L courses, which are your fundamental courses of the more core law subjects. This would be constitutional law, companies law, civil procedure code, um, criminal procedure code, all of those. Um, these are mandatory for the undergraduate students, not for the LLM students. What the LLM students typically opt for are the upper level classes. These are more optional and more specialized courses. So these courses um, are offered on the assumption that you already have your fundamentals in law in place. So because we are LLM students and because we already have an undergraduate degree in law, we are eligible to take and often LLM students do opt for these upper level courses. So these could be more specialized courses. For instance, if you're interested in, um, say you're a corporate lawyer, then you wouldn't do a course on companies law. What you would instead do is a course on, say, cross-border M&A, which is slightly more specialized. So that would be an upper-level course. Um, if you're interested in um, litigation, you won't do a course on civil procedure. You do a course on commercial litigation strategy. So those are upper-level courses. Um, these courses are usually where um, reading material is assigned to you and you show up to class, the professor usually explains these concepts in detail. And then there's a fair bit of the class that um, is, is about discussions and, you know, students give their opinions and, and there's a very transparent sort of give and take of opinions in class. So those are upper level courses. Then there's also something called seminars. 
So these are usually very small classes. It would not have more than eight to 12 students. And this is essentially like a discussion room. Um, you're given a lot more intense reading to do. It's not just a textbook where you're understanding concepts. It's more about academic articles on uh, the specific topic. You read about it. You make your, you think about it. You make your own notes, your own opinions. Do you agree with something? Do you disagree with something? Then you come into the seminar and the professor doesn't teach the seminar. The professor will simply lead the discussion. So the professor starts the discussion and then the onus is on all the students to contribute to the discussion. Um, so it's more like a reading circle, so to say. Um, so these are largely the two kinds of uh, classes that are uh, available for LLM students. Of course, apart from this, there's the clinics and uh, the, the externships that one can opt for. Upper level courses are um, evaluated or tested in two ways. You could have a multiple choice exam or you could have an essay based exam. Um, seminars usually have a paper that you have to submit. So it could be either one paper at the end of your semester, which would be an 8,000, 10,000 word paper, or it could be a series of short papers which are have to be submitted weekly or monthly. So the focus is they're slightly more academic in nature as opposed to an upper level course, which is just testing your concepts and teaching you concepts. Um, so yeah, this is how, and in terms of being uh, rigorous, um, I think it depends on the course that you choose, the professor that you choose. And um, the in, in the introductory class, the professors often tell you what the level of the course is. Is it going to be beginners? Is it going to be advanced? Do you need to have already taken certain courses to be eligible to take this course? So there will never be a situation where you're stuck in a course and you feel completely at sea and you don't know what to do. Um, even in terms of the course offerings, some courses are taught by university professors. Some are taught by ad hoc professors. So these ad hoc professors are usually um, practitioners who are invited by the university to teach specific courses. Um, for instance, if there are these super specialized courses, usually the upper level courses, those could be taught by practitioners of law while seminars and your 1L courses that are more academic in nature, those are taught by the university professors. Um, these practitioners could be law firm partners, they could be judges, they could be prosecutors, it would be from a whole range of uh, practitioners in the legal field. And that's also very useful and interesting because then your um, learning is not restricted to just what's given in the textbook. You actually also get a sneak peek into what the American legal system is like. For instance, um, I had done a course on commercial litigation strategy with a judge. This was He was a federal district judge in Philadelphia. So when he taught us, he often also uh, gave us a lot of anecdotes and insights into his experience. And, you know, you get a little bit of insight into what the federal legal system in the US is. So it was, I mean, I would always recommend that when you're choosing your courses, try to do a mix. Take courses from the university professor, but also try to take courses with these ad hoc professors who are practitioners, because then it gives you an insight into how it actually works in the American legal system as of date. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, when you mentioned the term ad hoc professor, so it basically means visiting faculty, right? Those practicing. Yes. Yes. They are, they are practitioners of law. They are not it's university not, professors. They're not, they're not yes. too academic even in their approach and they are more giving a practical outlook to yes. the whole course. Yes. Yes. One more question uh, to add to that. Uh, can an applicant transit from one course to another midway or does he necessarily or she have to complete and finish the entire course in one go? For example, let's say if you're pursuing a course, let's say in general law, and if you're not happy or satisfied, so that's the luxury. Is there a luxury that is given by the university to transit or change midway or you have to proceed <laughs> with it and finish no, it? No, no. So that flexibility is there. So at the beginning of every semester, there's something called an ad drop period. So during this period, you can go and attend whichever, how many ever classes that you're interested in. And at the end of the ad drop period, which is usually two or three weeks, you have to decide which courses you liked, which courses worked for you, and then select those and register yourself only those courses. So once you've registered, 
then unless there's some highly extenuating circumstance, they don't let you drop out of a course. But two weeks is usually a sufficient time to know. And even professors are aware of this ad drop period. So in the first couple of classes, they're more, the first couple of classes are more geared towards, you know, telling you what the course is like, what you should expect, what you should have already known if you want to sign up for this class, um, how you will be tested, how tough it will be, uh, how intensive the readings will be. So you have a fair idea of what it will be like by the end of the ad, ad drop period. Very well. Now, um, talking about the master's program, now that you're working in Dubai, did the master's program uh, benefit you here? And would you like to share any memorable experience from campus life, any lessons that you learned there? Um, I think having a, a master's degree from um, a US law school, specifically a top-ranked US law, law school, it just automatically gives this sense of um, confidence and trust um to to a to a potential recruiter when they are looking at your cv um unfortunately uh you know if you had to apply to an international law firm or anywhere outside india people are not going to be that familiar with indian law schools they don't know the quality and they are not able to assess looking at an applicant cv that oh this person went to this law school so maybe they are good maybe this is a law school of a good quality they can't make that assessment but if you have a master's from a, a well-known uh, you know, school, whether it's in US or Europe, but something that's very well-recognized internationally, and if that's on your CV, the person recruiting you or looking to recruit you is automatically going to think, okay, they have a certain caliber because they've gone to this school. So that just makes um, the path a little bit easier for you when you're looking to apply internationally. So you basically, you will have an edge over others, that academic edge that, yeah. that it would always be there. Yes, yes, definitely. Because when you're looking for, uh, when you're looking to work internationally outside India, whether it's in international firms or in regional firms, um, you're competing with applicants from all over the world. So if you have a degree from an internationally recognized school, it's just going to make it that much easier for you. Um, in fact, some international law firms have that as a prerequisite like they require you to have done your yeah. masters or your undergraduate with with you know one of these more recognized uh, schools in the western world so you know if someone's looking to work internationally then I, I would strongly recommend that they do a master's absolutely and i think even the the ivy league tag you know it does help yeah definitely yeah. because um the thing is that when, when we're looking to apply for jobs in India, uh, uh, the, the law firm or whoever is looking to recruit us has a fair idea of our background looking at our CV. Like if you've come from a certain school, if you worked at a certain firm, they have some context. So they're able to assess you better. But when you're, look, when you're applying to an international firm, they have no idea about the Indian legal education landscape or the law firm landscape. Like they would probably know like a couple of schools or a couple of law firms. That's it. So it's very difficult for them to assess someone's um, credentials or caliber or expertise. So when you have international experience, international education on your CV, then that gives them that sense of comfort that, yes, this person comes from a certain caliber because they went to a certain school. So it's, it's always um, helpful. And I mean, that's from a purely, you know, career perspective, looking for a job perspective. But even on a personal front, um, I think it's a great exercise in personal development because you get to live in a foreign country. You're exposed to a completely different legal system, um, a more complex legal system. Um, so you just learn so much by watching what is happening around you just by absorbing what your professors are saying. If you're in clinics, you're seeing a different legal system in action. So it definitely makes you a better, a more rounded lawyer because now you're not going to look at things only from an Indian law perspective. You're going to have a more rounded, um, a, a rounded learning of different legal concepts. Um, you're exposed to a different culture, an absolutely different social setting. So that that in itself is such a rich experience. And then, of course, you get to develop a global network. Like um, your LLM class is going to be your network for life. So 
even if you know you don't want to or don't end up uh, getting the opportunity to work in an international law firm and you go back home is these these experiences are still going to make you richer a better lawyer a better person and you're going to have a great network so i don't see any downsides to um pursuing an llm abroad fantastic now uh talking about the importance of having a mentor well uh personally i never had one during the law school llb program either during uh the masters program but did you have any and if yes then who was that mentor who guided you thoroughly from uh the application procedure to finishing the masters program um so i didn't have any um individual mentors um but from my experience and the way i did it and when i look back at it i would say that it's very useful to one talk to your own college professors because they are going to know of alumni who have been in your boat who've done their masters abroad and they are going to be able to connect you to them um so that's extremely useful secondly i would say reaching out to um past llm graduates who've gone to the schools that you're aiming for i think just talking to them about their experiences is extremely helpful because they are going to tell you what to do and not do during the application process and then they'll also help you um refine your decision about which school works best for you because they've been there so they have the lived experience so i would say talking to your professors and talking to um alumni of any of the uh, schools that you're looking to apply to for your llm is is the best way of uh, you know making sure that you do all the right things for your application and then you end up choosing the right school for yourself yeah so i think first narrowing down to the university where you wish to apply and pursue your masters and then connecting to the concerned professor or the alumnus who's who studied there yeah i think that, that is the best narrowing way. down three or four schools oh, three and or four. then yeah hmm. and, and then approaching your professors approaching the alumni so then it helps you make that decision that no this is what i need to do and this is the school that is the best is the perfect one for me very well now um talk what would be your piece of advice to all the young law graduates lo young lawyers law students who wish to apply to upen for a masters program um i would say if you want to apply to upen start preparing in advance like this is not something you can do in 6 months like you need to build your profile for it um have good grades i think that's non negotiable no matter which school you're going to apply to um requisite work experience i know there are people who do their masters directly after uh, graduating from their llb as well but the more work experience you have the easier it is going to be for you to get accepted into the school of your choice um and thirdly have a clear sense of your goals that this is what i want to do so my past work experience reflects how i'm moving forward in the direction of my goal then you talk about how doing the llm is going to help you achieve your goal and then finally how you can contribute to the school it's not just about um you know that the, the school is going to help further my objective or take me closer to the goal you also have to demonstrate how you'll enrich the school with uh, you know your presence and being a student there so i think if if you are able to show through your sop through your cv through your work experience all of these things then it's not going to be very difficult to be accepted into pen or any school of your choice because this is what they're looking for essentially is and i think that uh, you know 20 30 years ago uh, there used to be this notion that uh, pe that people would stick to that if you want to teach then do your masters you know if you really if you're not academically inclined or if you don't see a career in teaching or in academics then you don't have to do it but i think now the times have changed and even the dynamics have you know changed a lot yeah i think so because um firstly if you want to work outside india internationally then an llm makes it significantly easier it opens up the doors at the very least um so that's one secondly even in terms of you know you may not be an academic or want to pursue an academic career but you know if you are somebody who is genuinely interested in furthering your legal education and having a more rounded development of your legal skills then 
the LLM is the best way to do it because it's just going to be a year off from your professional career, but it's going to bring so much um, you know, to you um, as, as a lawyer, as an individual that it does contribute professionally, you know, e even if you're not looking at uh, becoming an academic and just the general personal uh, development and growth that you see because you live in a foreign country, you, you, you meet people from all over the world, you build these networks and these contacts. Um, I, I think um, it, it just has so many intangible benefits that one may not instantly see. But uh, yeah, it definitely helps in, in one's growth as an individual and as a lawyer. Yeah, and most importantly, you say, stay away from your family. So growth happens when your relatives are not around and you're yeah, on Yeah, no, for day. sure. Yeah, exactly, growth. right? Yeah, adulting at its finest. Absolutely. So when you make mistakes, you learn from them and that is how you grow in life. And yeah. also in India, when you're pursuing an LLB course, you're competing with Indian nationals, with people from different states and there you're competing internationally. So there are different yeah. nationalities, there are uh, you know, uh, students from uh, probably overseas. So it, that that makes a huge difference to your outlook. Yeah, exactly. Now some call it a nine month uh, uh, you know, picnic. But I really don't agree with that. I think if your if the curriculum is rigorous and if it's a structured program and it, it's obviously an Ivy League, then I think one should go ahead and pursue it. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, if um if one cannot afford themselves more time to. Uh, do a longer course there are some colleges in Europe I think that also have two-year LLM courses um, then one should definitely do this because um, ultimately it's about how much you can do and how much you want to do and take out of that year so there are people who choose to do nothing but you know just have a social life which is great because maybe that was their objective but then if you do choose you can um take 30 credits if you want. You can write an academic paper. You can be a research assistant. You can be a part of a journal. You can uh, be a part of a clinic. You can do pro bono work. You can do an internship. There's just so much that you can squeeze into that one year to make it as wholesome and fulfilling as you want. So ultimately, I think um, as someone um, told me when I, you know, in my first week in Philadelphia, they said the LLM is like a buffet. You know, you have have to pick and choose what you can to make it the year that you want it to be so that you achieve what you want out of uh, being at the school and doing the LLM. So I think that just sums it the best. I was told probably the same when I was in uh, GLT. <laughs> it's like a buffet. Be wise and choose, you know, yeah. as per your uh, needs. So, uh, so in short, there was no individual mentor in your case. So to all the viewers who are watching, it is very important to plan everything well in advance, strategize everything. You need to understand that it's not a cakewalk to crack or, uh, you know, get a position at an Ivy League university and that too as prestigious as UPenn. So please plan everything well in advance. And that is the only way you can crack and get a secure admission um, at UPenn. So now, uh, talking about scholarships, uh, Manali, uh, does UPenn offer any scholarship? Were you on a scholarship? If you could talk um, about scholarships in, in detail. Yeah. yeah um, I... Scholarship. So, of course, for the... For the human rights scholarship, um, you have to show that, you know, you have a demonstrated career in human rights and you intend to pursue that going forward. And the same for public interest, you have to show that you intend to pursue a career in public interest, um, which is basically nonprofit work, social work. And um, so then the scholarship is awarded to those specific students only. Um, apart from this, uh, they don't have any other um, offerings in terms of scholarships, but I believe there are quite a few um, American organizations and Indian organizations that one can separately reach out to for non-college specific uh, scholarships as well. I think it would be moralized there on the website also. And uh... Yeah, yeah. Sure and in fact, even uh, once you uh, start the process of applying, um, you'll get uh, that the college administration will be regularly in touch with you. So every week okay. or so you will get emails from them where they will keep telling you this is the next step in the process. 
um, you know, you can apply for these scholarships. These are the offerings. So whether it's scholarships, whether it's accommodation, um, whether it's your visa, you keep uh, getting emails from the college and they sort of handhold you through the entire process. So you won't be lost or trying to figure out anything on your own at any stage once you start the process. Right. And now uh, talking about uh, hostel accommodation. So does UPenn guarantee a hostel accommodation on campus or you have to look for your own accommodation when you secure admission? Um, so I don't think they guarantee it. They definitely have um, campus accommodation. You can apply for it and a basis vacancy, you can get it. Um, but from my experience and my time in UPenn, it was largely the undergraduate students of the university who opted for campus accommodation and the graduate students, which is LLMs or any other master students, they usually lived off campus. Um, but because, like I've mentioned, all of Western uh, Philadelphia is basically UPenn because it has so many colleges and there are fraternity houses and then there are sorority houses. So all of West Philadelphia basically feels like an extension of the college. So even if you're living off campus, you're still going to end up living in a building with like five students from Penn. Or, you know, if you're going to go to any cafe or restaurant or supermarket around your house in Western Philly, you're just going to see, um, you know, Penn students. Um, so it doesn't really make that much of a difference. And in terms of um, pricing, it's definitely cheaper to stay off campus because then you can, you know, choose the type of accommodation uh, you want to stay in. So, yeah, I would recommend if you are going to Penn, just stay off campus. A lot of people who chose to stay on campus also by the second semester then decide to move out and uh, live off campus. And there's a ton of student housing available around the university because, you know, all, all the uh, property management companies also gearing their properties towards renting to students. And there are lots of uh, Facebook pages, social media pages. I think even Penn has uh, a, a portal where you can find flatmates and roommates if you know you don't know anyone going into the college. So then it's very easy to even find flatmates. And how's the placement situation there post-COVID? Um... Um, so for LLM students, I think it's always been really difficult. Uh, for them to crack the U.S. job market. And um, especially if you're on the Eastern coast, New York is anyway notorious for having high entry barriers and it's intensely competitive. Um, so no, it's not a cakewalk. It's extremely difficult. Um, from my time in Penn, only a handful of students got jobs with law firms in uh, U.S., and specifically in New York. Um, some of them went to Europe um, but that was it. And um, in terms of, and you know, there, there are very different considerations behind how and why people get these jobs. For example, people who are coming from Europe or even South America, you know, language skills play a big role. Or if, you know, there are firms that do a lot of business stay with South America. So then they're more keen to hire South American LLM graduates. So there are lots of these different considerations. Um, when it comes to Indian students, I think if you're from a more recognized law school, like one of the national law schools, if you work with one of the handful of firms that are more famous internationally, like, you know, one of the top two, three uh, ranked law firms in the country, then it makes it a little bit easier because then someone looks at your profile, they can recognize, okay, you've gone to the best law school in India, okay, you've worked at the best law firm in India, because, you know, in their head, there are just these two, three firms that they're familiar with. So then that makes it easier for them to at least um, offer you that interview. And then, of course, it's on you. But the market's intensely competitive, and you're competing with students from the world over. Sometimes there are language requirements. Sometimes, you know, there are firms that want someone from a particular country because they do so much business in, in that country. So all of these things sort of work towards Indian students' disadvantage. But definitely, of course, there are Indians who crack the U.S. job market and make it. I don't think there's any, um, any thumb rule or any formula or any checklist that you can apply. I think um, you just do your best. You network a lot. You tap every resource you have. 
and um, ho hopefully something clicks. But I think coming from a more recognized university and with work experience in a firm that's recognized globally, I think that definitely opens up doors a lot quicker. And lastly, um, although it's a very technical question, but uh, what are the visa requirements as far as uh, the application procedure is concerned? What type of visa or kind of visa is required? Uh, um, so uh, to do an LLM or any master's program in the US, you would need an F1 visa. Um, to get the F1 visa, your university will give you an I-20 form. So once you are admitted and you know, you've accepted the admission, you've paid your deposit, your university will take you through the process of how to get the visa. So you fill in a form, then they give you the I-20 form, and then you have to take your I-20 form, and then there'll be a host of other requirements, like for example, take your admission letter, um, take your financial statements, and the other documents that the US um, uh, immigration authorities typically require, and then you just apply for your F-1 visa on that basis. Um, but if you have your I-20 from a top US university, Honestly, um, it's not very difficult getting the visa. They just look at the I-20, they look at the name of your college and, you know, they stamp the visa on your passport. Um, so, yeah. And again, your university takes you through the whole process. So you won't feel lost or, you know, oh, I, I need to do this myself. I need to apply for the visa myself. It's not like that. The university has to give you that form and they help you and take you through the process of doing it. Well, there you go. Thank you so much, uh, Manali, for taking out time, for doing this session for us, for all the valuable tips that you shared with all the viewers. Spoke about your LLM journey in great detail. You, you did share valuable insights on the master's program from this very prestigious university. Uh, anything that you wish to say as parting words before we wrap this segment? Um, I think I've already spoken uh, quite uh -huh. a lot. I hope it, this was useful um, for anybody who wants to apply to Penn or to any other university in the US. Um, and yeah, I would just say good luck. And if it's something that you can do, if you can take a break from your career for a year and do the master's, I would definitely say go for it. You are not going to regret it, uh, no matter which school you go to. So yeah, don't overthink it. Just work towards it and um, good luck. So to all the viewers who are watching, email is mentioned on the channel. Feel free to write to us in case if you still have any queries. I'm sure your queries must have been answered by now. In case if you still have, then feel free, feel free to write to us. We'll be more than happy to, to assist you and to forward the same to our Amicus for today's session. Thank you, Manali, once again. It's goodbye for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.